Hi, my name is Gal Lawrence and thanks for tuning into my podcast today. If you're enjoying these conversations and you want to check out more of this transformational work, be sure to come back to guylawrence.com.au and join me as we go further down the rabbit hole. Enjoy the show. Dennis, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for asking me. It's a pleasure to be here. I love ask every, asking everyone on the show when they first come on, and especially like yourself that probably travels a lot. If you sat next to a stranger on an airplane and they asked you what you did for a living these days, what would you say? <laughs> I'd say it's an awkward moment. <laughs> um, I would... I would assess the person in a in a uh, in a flash and figure out uh, and kind of get a feeling for what I could say. Uh, chances are, I might just say, "Oh, I'm a retired professor." Okay. You know, other people, I might say, "Well, I'm, I'm an ethnopharmacologist," and then that might open the conversation to a real conversation, and then I'd have to explain what that is. And yeah, you know, you, you make interesting encounters on airplanes for sure you know it's it's an interesting environment because the you know the usual practice and i'm i'm as guilty as anyone that is to just ignore the other person beside you as though they were not even real you know like yeah. they were a, a puppet or something uh, but depending on the vibe you know uh i might try to initiate a conversation or if they they talk to me i kind of decide on the on the fly what i can share and uh, you know <laughs> yeah fair enough fair enough i got and i gotta ask you because it was only yesterday i saw an ethnopharmacologist and i was like oh what is that so I, i'm gonna ask you that anyway if that's all right sure sure well if i have a uh, if i have a, a a title or a specialty that i could name i'm kind of all over the place, but an ethnopharmacologist is what I say I am, and I guess I legitimately come by that that name because that's that's the word I that's the word that describes what I've done for forty five years. I can give you a formal definition if you'd like. <laughs> That'd um, be perfect. Yeah, it's it's kind of awkward, but it it all hangs together. So ethnopharmacology is the interdisciplinary study of biologically active substances used or observed by humans in traditional societies. Wow. So all, all of those, you know, it's a kind of a tortured definition, uh, but, but all of those things hang together in the sense that it's not confined to plants, you know, I mean, fungi, animals, uh, every kind of thing, many things in nature that are not plants contain biologically active substances. You know, what's another word for, for drugs? But they can be toxins, they can be many things. Uh, and so the biological activities, you know, is the pharmacology part. And uh, the, uh, you know, and they are not necessarily medicines ingested by humans, you know, so used or observed by humans, you know, is that part of the definition, uh, uh, you know, uh, for example, arrow poisons are a good topic for ethnopharmacology. And, uh, you know, there's, there's a, a quite a lot of research on arrow poisons, you know, because some important medicines cardiac medicines and that sort of thing have been developed on, on arrow poisons. So these are generally not used by humans, but they're, you know, they're employed by humans. Got it. And then the traditional society part kind of narrows the, the focus because really, you know, if, if you didn't have that qualifier, then, then pharmacology as such would be a subset of ethnopharmacology because ethnopharmacology you know, it's something that humans do, you know, I mean, so all of biomedicine, all of, uh, you know, scientific pharmacology and so on, is really ethnopharmacology in some ways. But, you know, we, we, we narrow the focus to the, the use of biologically active substances in 
you know, not in the global culture, but in traditional societies or indigenous or however you want to think of that. So that's the definition. And that's why there are so many parts to it because it's a, you know, and there are of course many other definitions, but for mm-hmm. example, uh, I don't know, um, Steve uh, might've told you that uh, I organized a conference in, in 2017 in the UK he did mention it, yes. Ethnopharmacologic Search for Psychoactive Drugs. And Steve was there, Mitch was there. In fact, they were, they were more than there. They were very much helping with the live streaming and all the technical stuff. So that conference was the 50th commemorative anniversary of the first one, which happened in 1967 in San Francisco, sponsored by the National Institute of Mental Health. And so it was a legitimate, you know, government conference and, uh, you know, but it was just ironic that it happened in in San Francisco in 1967. That same year was like the so-called summer of love, Uh, you know, the hippie countercultural revolution. Um, The conference had nothing to do with that. Nobody even knew it was happening. In fact, it was a few months, it was early in 2017. Uh, but that was the coolest thing going on in San Francisco from my point of view. And then the only thing that uh, ever uh, came out of it was uh, this volume, you know, on a F, I mean, it was a closed conference. It was not open to the public, but they published this volume called Ethnopharmacologic Search for Psychoactive Drugs. And that volume came into my hands at the age of 18 you know, the next summer after wow. was, and I come and that's what got me on this path, you know, because I, I totally, I couldn't believe in the first place that the U S government of all people or of all institutions would even publish such a thing, you know, because, because of the topic and, and, uh, you know, there were supposed to be follow-up uh, conferences every 10 years or so. And then the war on drugs came along. The government was embarrassed that they'd ever had anything to do with this. So none of those follow-up conferences ever happened. And yet ethnopharmacology continued to develop as a, as a discipline. Discoveries were made and so on. So it became sort of a uh, bucket list uh you know, milestone for me to do a commemorative conference. And uh, in 2017, everything came together. You know, I found a venue, beautiful country house in, in English, uh, English uh, countryside near Buckinghamshire, found, you know, enough support to invite some people and, and so on. So we we pub we presented that conference, and then we came out <clears throat> trying to be true to the spirit of the original one. So even though ours was more public, so we live streamed it on Facebook. So wow. we had you know seventy five thousand people looking at some of these lectures. Uh, you know, and and overall over four days, we got about half a million clicks. And, uh, and we recorded the videos and the videos are, are still online. Anybody can, uh, can access them. And then we published the symposium proceedings, but we, we published the 2017 proceedings, but we decided, well, let's reprint the 1967 book as well, because it was more or less out of print. It was in the public domain, taxpayers paid for it, so there was no copyright issue. So we came out with a really beautiful collector's edition box set of these two books. And uh, it's been wonderful, actually. It's been, it's, it, it's been well received. I can... I can uh, We've come a long way since 1967. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's come a long way. Let me see if I can... Um, pull up this uh, link to send to you. Uh, wait a minute. Okay. Uh, 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 
We, we don't have to. Uh, I'll send it to you later. But oh, here it is. Okay. Yeah, I'll link it in the show notes for sure. I, yeah. I have to ask you, Dennis, that book you read in, as 18 year old in 1967, what was it then that sparked you into your journey about that book? This well, the interesting thing was, you know, I, so I was 16, 17, 18 at that time. My brother was off in Berkeley, you know, and we were both obsessed with psychedelics, you know, um, and very much part of the cultural conversation at that time. And he was like sending me news from, you know, the West Coast where the action was. Here I am stuck in this Colorado mining town, essentially, in the mountains. I'm feeling very cut off, you know. So, so Terrence was there, you know, out where on the West Coast where I wanted to be more than anything, right in the middle of it, you know. And two two important books came to my attention at that at, in that period one of these was this book which and the other one was the the teachings of don juan with by carlos castaneda which was his first book and his first book was probably you know the closest to the actual truth i mean he went on to write lots of books most of which is made up you know not that it's bad stuff but it's it's not really accurate but when the teachings of don juan came along i i realized you know i mean i we nobody knew it was it was not accurate at the time it seemed really fascinating and, and that that was like two pages two sides of the same coin you know um by reading that book i realized there was an ethnographic connection and what the ethnography and that these things were you know, not new at all, had been used for thousands of years and there was tradition, you know, there was, there was, uh, you know, traditions of use. So there was that, but then the ethnopharmacologic search book showed me the science side of it. And, you know, the other side of the coin was, yeah, not only is there ethnography and history and culture, there's a whole scientific aspect to this, which uh, I was, uh, you know, I mean, I knew it existed, but I didn't, until I discovered that book, I didn't really know what it was. And so that book inspired me and, and decide, both of those books inspired me to, you know, direct my career toward ethnopharmacology, you know, without really thinking, well, how am I going to get a job out of this and so on. I didn't do that. I did it because I was interested. And I'm, I'm one of those people that, uh, you know, I pursue what I'm interested in. It's not necessarily going to get me a job. In fact, coming out of my PhD and stuff like that with a specialty in ethnopharm, not only ethnopharmacology, but ethnopharmacology of psychedelics, you know, who the hell is going to touch me as a, you know, employment prospect? For sure. Well, how you, you know a question that, that springs to mind, uh, Darius? Like psychedelics, how would you? What are, what are they exactly? Because I think there's such a misconception out there. When you say that word, you can put whatever belief system you want to it. I think, you know, how yeah, you... the the, uh, the 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 nomenclature, the the terminology for these drugs is all over the place, and that's you know. They're, they're called hallucinogens, they're called, uh, you know, entheogens, sometimes they're called like mystical memetics and, and psychotomimetics and all these things. These terms really uh, are an example of how difficult it is to describe just what exactly they do, you know. And psychedelic is a deliberately vague term, and I, I like it because it, for one thing, it, it's an older term. It was one of the first terms, but it, um, it, it means mind manifesting, right? So it, you know, psychedelic okay. means mind manifesting, psyche, mind, and delos is to delineate or manifest. So, so um, it seems appropriate because you're not putting any spin on it, it manifests different aspects of the mind. And depending on set and setting, the circumstances, which are all important for the kind of experience that you have, you can have almost any kind of experience. I mean, it can be a, 
religious experience or it can be a you know psychotic experience or it can it can be many things but whatever it does it manifests the mind in some respect and that's why i like the term because it's deliberately a vague term and thus more accurate because other terms like hallucinogen they don't really cause hallucinations you know this class of i mean they can but that's not characteristically or always what they're about you know they don't really mimic psychosis you know they i mean aspects may resemble psychosis they don't really even you know i mean mystical mimetic is like it simulates mystical experiences uh, but that's a big word to wrap your tongue around and even that is not really accurate because it depends on again circumstances uh, you know the same person can take the same medicine in different experiences in different circumstances maybe have a profound mystical experience and the next time under different circumstances might have a you know experience the hell world you know so mm. You know, I mean, you, you know how the term um, psychedelic came about, do you? I have no idea. No idea. Okay, well, Humphrey Osmond, who was one of the early uh, clinicians that was exploring LSD, mostly for the treatment of, of alcoholism, and Aldous Huxley, you know who he was. And Osmond is the person who gave Aldous Huxley mescaline for the first time. And they corresponded, right? They, they actually used letters at that time. So it was, a, it was a, you know, slower process, but they were discussing, you know, what do we call these things? And, and Huxley wrote uh, something about, uh, I, I don't know, but it, it had something to do with take a pinch of phenarothine. That, that was the term that, that he proposed. And, and Osmond wrote back and said to sink in hell or soar angelic take a take a pinch of psychedelic and that's the word that got that got taken. used that got adapted so so it came out of that conversation wow in terms of psychedelics then why when or why would somebody start exploring this i mean you you've obviously not seen a lot of studies over the years and the impact it has on people. Maybe that's a good place to start. What kind of impact is it having on people long-term? And when or why would somebody want to explore them? Well, I think, you know, there are all sorts of reasons. Uh, but I think inherently we are a curious species. You know, we're curious about things. This is, you know, this is what drives discovery. This is what drives a lot of creativity. You know, this impulse to understand how things are. And psychedelics provide a, a window into our consciousness, you know, which is perhaps the most interesting game in town in a certain way, to, because actually everything is filtered through consciousness. You know, so if we can expand consciousness or use these medicines to explore kind of the limits of conscious experience, uh, then that appeals to people's, you know, curiosity. And so I think curiosity is the impulse. And then, you know, as people use them, everybody has their own set of problems. I mean, many mm. people have, you know, diagnosed problems like depression or PTSD and so on. Everybody's got some degree of that, right? Because I don't think you can live in this world without being traumatized, you know, in particular territory. And then people experimented with this and they found that, yeah, this can, these things under the right circumstances can provide relief from those things, you know, they're, so they're tools for exploring consciousness but they also have a therapeutic, uh, you know, therapeutic application. Um, and I'm very much, you know, in favor of all this research and, you know, all this clinical work uh, with psilocybin and other things. I think this is great because it, because in some ways mental health care these days is kind of a joke. You know, it's not very effective for a lot of these chronic conditions and the best, uh, medications that are currently accepted are things like SSRIs, you know, 
which don't really resolve the problem. They're like band-aids. They paper it over, but they don't really resolve it. Many people say, and it's, it's not a cliche, they'll say that, you know, my ayahuasca session or my psilocybin session or whatever was like 10 years of psychotherapy in a single night. You know, so the power of that is recognized and, uh, you know, they just work. I mean, they need guidance. They need the right setting. They need, hopefully, the help of experienced uh, therapists, guides, or shamans. Whatever costume they're wearing doesn't matter. The point is shamans and, and um, psychotherapists fulfill very similar functions you know i mean that the, the cultural context is different the assumptions are different mm -hmm. the point is that you provide a safe and supportive set, setting for people to directly have their experience with these medicines and and learn what they can i i say the medicine is the teacher you know or going at reiterating that a different way you're the teacher you know, you are your own teacher. The medicines facilitate your learning, your insights into your condition uh, that can lead to healing and resolution. But psychedelics are a bit of a, uh, you know, they're a threat to conventional mental health care because they don't really fit into the capitalist uh, you know, para the biomedical paradigm where, you know, if you're lucky, you get to talk to a therapist for maybe 10 minutes, you know, and you expect to go out the door with a prescription, probably for some SSRI or other psychopharmaceutical, you still have all the problems. You've just numbed them down. You know, psychedelics actually <laughs> give you the, the, ch the tool get to the root of these things mm. and actually resolve your question but it requires a different therapeutic paradigm you know i mean it resolves it requires that therapists spend not 10 minutes with a patient but like hours you know and so that messes up the revenue model yeah. but it is a necessary uh, way to approach it so these things potentially are going to revolutionize mental health care and it's about time because mental health care is not very effective the way it is now. Totally. I, I remember um, I, I did uh, my very first ayahuasca ceremony back in 2013, 14, I think about six years ago. Uh -huh. And and I've spent months preparing. I was in the, the, the right hands, the right environment. I was terrified before I did it. Um, it was probably the most courageous decision of my life at that point. Uh -huh. um, and... And what happened that night changed, honestly, like it took, it took months to integrate it, but it actually changed the whole direction of my life. Like the, the wisdom that came from that, I, I still struggle to even describe it to this day to people. So there you are. You're a satisfied customer. Exactly. Yeah, you, <laughs> I was a, I was a very a nervous bit. customer before. Yeah, well, and that's okay. It's all right to approach these things with a bit of... Uh, you know, a bit of butterflies in the stomach kind of thing, because they do deserve respect, you know, and the, and the, the, you know, your nervousness is healthy. It's a sign of respect. Okay. You're not playing around here. This is a serious, oh, yeah. movement, you know, and I often say in my talks, you know, you, uh, you know, often the question of faith comes up and I, and, you know, you don't have to have faith to take a psychedelic, you know, believe anything. In fact, it's better if you don't, you know, you, uh, what you need is courage. You know, what, what you need is the courage to, you know, trust yourself enough, trust the medicine mm -hmm. enough, trust the circumstances enough to take that plunge, you know, to step off the cliff as it were. You know, and you may find, you know, you may say, oh, God, I'm falling into the abyss. I'm completely lost. But then the next thing that happens, wait a minute, I'm floating. <laughs> this is not, I'm not going to crash on the rocks below. I'll be able to spend some time in these dimensions and learn from it.
Yeah, yeah, totally. I I am um, I got you mentioned the word consciousness earlier as well. And w- with your ex- experience with all this and your life's experience, what what does consciousness mean to you? How would you? <laughs> <laughs> because because it's certainly it you know, I I kind of have this inward conversation with myself all the time because from different experiences through my life, you you begin to question things more and more. And yeah. uh, I'd love to, yeah, I'd love to hear your view on it. Well, you know, philosophers and neuroscientists and scientists and everybody have talked about what is consciousness forever. It is kind of the topic of conversation. And, you know, consciousness is, is many things, but I, I think, you know, consciousness implies self-awareness you know, awareness of your experience. I mean, we can, uh, you know, we don't know entirely what the, uh, what structures and processes in the brain underlie consciousness, but we know very well how to abolish it. You know, I mean, anesthetics abolish it. Mm -hmm. Sleep is not really, sleep is maybe not a good term because even though you're asleep, you're still, you know, you are unconscious, but that doesn't mean the brain is not doing its thing. You know, it's doing lots of things while you're asleep. But this idea of uh, general awareness of being a subjective experience, you know, and being in a, you know, having an orientation to place and, and space and time, um, you know, those are kind of the, uh, you know, uh, essential qualities of consciousness. And in fact, in, in the term, in discussions about consciousness, there's, there's an interesting uh, neuroscientist, uh, uh, I think his name is Ramachandran, he, the University of New Mexico, of uh, San Diego. And he talks about, you know, qualia and like there are many selves, you know, and it's probably two complicated to talk about this but there it's not that consciousness is necessarily one thing it's a constellation of things you know and there are certain aspects that are you know uh like looking after you know your focus on place and time your executive judgment this sort of thing but then you've got intuition and you've got imagination and you have all of these things that are, that are uh, sort of spun together. You know, I, I like to uh, talk about how, you know, we, you know, we construct our own reality. You know, we live inside of a hallucination in a sense. I sometimes call it the serotonin hallucination, but that's a misnomer because everything we experience is a reflection of our neurochemical brain state, you know, and what the brain does is take information from the outside through your sensory portals, your eyes, ears, and other receptors, associate with, you know, take all that, mix it all together with stuff you already know, like memories and associations Mm -hmm. and other types of things. And it mixes all this together. And this is like the raw data of, of experience, the raw data of reality. And it's like you dump all that into a big blender (laughs) and then you spin up the blender and everything mixes together, you know, and then you can pour it out. And then you, what, what you do is you extrude it out into the movie that you've just created. You're the director, star, and every, you know, producer and everything else for this movie you construct for yourself. It's your reality. It's your reality hallucination. And everyone has one of those. You know, some are not so interesting, some are, but, but to the person, they're always interesting because that, that's what they have. And this is not necessarily a reflection of what of, of reality. We don't know what reality looks like because what we what this is is a model of reality that you know we construct so that we can make sense out of the world. I mean, if we didn't have this function, 
the world would be just a blooming, buzzing bunch of inputs and so on. So, mm -hmm. so the brain is, you know, brain not only constructs reality this way, but, but it works, you know, a lot of it is what the brain does not let in. I mean, the brain is a filtering function as much as anything else. There, the term in neuroscience is called neural gating. And uh, you have to block most everything. Uh, you have to keep it out so that you can then work with the reduced data set to try and arrange it in a way that you can comprehend. Makes and sense. that's your experience of consciousness. And it doesn't, it, 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 it must reflect reality in some sense, but it's not reality. It's this, it's this construct that, that we make, you know, and that's what the brain does. And, and do you think psychedelics then is widening that gating? When yes. You, and, yes. and rewriting the movie, would that be fair? That's, that's playing right. inside. Yeah, that's exactly what it does. It widens the gating or... It lowers a lot of these gating mechanisms, and in, in some, it lowers a lot of these. So it does widen what you can perceive. One of the things it does is it brings the background forward. You know, these these girl, uh, neural uh, gating mechanisms are designed to suppress most everything that's going on in the background. It's not immediately relevant to your survival. So it kind of fades into the background and, and the brain tends to focus on what is really immediately in front of you. You know, the bus coming at you or the saber tooth tiger or whatever that might impinge on your actual survival. That's where you want to be focused, right? And that's why it's important when you take psychedelics to do it in special circumstances because you're deliberately lowering your defenses and your and your you know your defocusing. So instead of focusing on you know a very narrow focus of attention, you're kind of giving up attention in some ways, mm -hmm. or you're softening it so that you. And as long as you're in a uh, you know safe environment, no buses coming after you, no saber tooth tigers and that sort of thing then you can trust yourself to let it go and lower these neural uh, gates that, that the brain constructs, you know, for very practical reasons. You can lower those and you bring the background forward, you know, and, and so, um, you know, there are now what I used to and still do call the reality hallucination. It, it's now been, formally defined by uh, Robin Carhart Harris, who is a very uh, respected neuroscientist who studied psychedelics. He talks about the default mode network. You've heard of that term, yeah? Uh, yes, I've heard of that term. Yeah, essentially it's the same thing. The default mode network is this, this constructed reality that we experience you know uh, it's it's based on you know past experience and memories and projections of how we think it's going to be in the future based on what we've already know and then sensory data it's all the same and psychedelics temporarily disrupt that and that's very useful that's very useful for exploring consciousness and it's very useful therapeutically because people can essentially step out of the box temporarily. And that's where a lot of therapy can go on if you can just distance yourself from your immediate situation, look at it as though from an outside observer. So if mm. you're involved in things like uh, addiction or uh, PTSD or these various things, you can step out of that reference frame, look at it in a different way, and in some ways, uh, you know, um, you, you, uh, well, you can integrate that perspective, I guess. So yeah. that you, you know, you can get away from these habitual behaviors and these, these, these behavioral loops that are created, you know, out of a, 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 a essentially a dysfunctional default mode network, you know, where yeah. you have these, these processes going on. It's like, it's literally like rebooting your hard drive. 
totally they don't have hard drives anymore but it's like rebooting a computer where when it comes back up you know you've gotten a rid of a lot of clutch that shows up you know in in computers it runs faster it, it it's more efficient in the way it allocates time i think literally that's what's going on i think that you can i think that by by hitting your brain with this massive um, activation of serotonin, uh, which is pretty much what they are, uh, you can um, you know uh, you can rearrange you know um, I mean during the experience, and they've done scanning studies and all that that show that all these systems that normally don't connect with each other are hyper-connected during this experience. And then after the experience, it settles down, but they, there's still communication going on and it's, it's possibly more efficient. And a lot of the stuff that uh, tends to slow things down or mess things up, that has been eliminated. Yeah. You know? and, and then it, of course, we tend to get back into habitual behavior and, but, eventually, but you can always go back and drink from the well again. And I think it's useful for people to do that periodically. Totally. I, I hear them. Um, uh, I, I think the analogy, like we're, we're look inside a jam jar looking out and, and having these experiences allow us to step outside of our own jam jar and, and look back and maybe even read the label on the front. And then you that, get... That is exactly. That, that's a good analogy. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, we're we're all within some set of assumptions and and habits and everything else, and we you know we make the mistake of thinking that this is reality. No, it's a version of reality that you've connected, that you've constructed. You know, and it's a very useful. It, it's very useful. I mean, we we want to be in that in a uh, you know well functioning default mode network of most mm -hmm. of the time. But it's important to be able to step outside of it, you know, and people that never step outside of it, well, they're missing a lot, you know, and they're, they're risking, um, you know, essentially they're denying themselves a learning opportunity, you know, uh, uh, to rethink how they are, how they think, how they relate to the world and so on. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you know the other the other question that's coming to mind as well is with psychedelics is that there is there are so many different psychedelics as well, and mm -hmm. do they are the, do all paths lead to the same place or or do you use different psychedelics for for different modalities? Well, you can you can um, getting into the I mean there are many things. Uh, that are psychoactive, you know, that will produce profoundly altered states of consciousness that are not necessarily psychedelics. Depends on how narrowly you want to define them. For example, you know, I, just for the sake of, of facilitating the discussion, I, I tend to, uh, I, I sometimes say, well, true psychedelics, if something is a true psychedelic, it, it works on the serotonin 2A receptors. It's an agonist of the serotonin 2A receptors, which is one of the subtypes, about 14 different subtypes of serotonin. And the true psychedelics all hit those receptors, psilocybin, DMT, LSD, mescaline, the ones we think of as the classic psychedelics, they're all 5-HT2A receptors. Something like MDMA, it's not a psychedelic, you know, it, it works on serotonin, but it works on releasing serotonin from presynaptic storage vessels. And so it works on the, what's called the serotonin transporter, which is a, a protein pump in the presynaptic membrane that controls the release and reuptake of the neurotransmitter at, at the synaptic junction, right? At the synaptic gap. It's all under the control of these, uh, you know, these uh, transporters. MDMA jams that transporter open. All of the serotonin leaks out. Suddenly your brain is flooded with serotonin. 
well, serotonin is the feel-good hormone. So you feel really good. You feel euphoric, full of love, open-hearted, all that. And that's all very therapeutic, right? That's useful. Mm. SSRIs work on the same thing. They work on, uh, they're called selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. That's what SSRI means. And they have the opposite effect. They actually jam the transporter closed. So the serotonin that's in the synaptic junction cannot be taken back up and recycled. It stays in the synaptic junction. So you have a higher level of serotonin there. That's the basis of the therapeutic effect of, uh, of uh, SSRIs. So MDMA and SSRIs have an opposite effect. They have the same, they have the same target, if you will. Something like salvinorin A, completely outside, you know, from the, the diterpene from the Mexican mint, salvia divinorum, you may have had experience with it. That works on a completely different system. You know, that works on the kappa mm. opiate receptors. So nothing to do with serotonin. Absolutely profoundly consciousness altering, you know, I mean, in a, in a way that's, uh, you know, fascinating, but a lot of people, and, and in some ways dysphoric, you know, but uh, some people like it. It's not my cup of tea. It's very bizarre. Have you ever experienced it? I haven't. No, I haven't. Well, it, it's worth putting on your map <laughs> because it is so strange, you know, uh, and, and, you know, but these things are strictly not, in, if you, if you cleave to the strict definition of psychedelics, these aren't psychedelics, but they're certainly psychoactive okay. and, uh, other things are things like detours, you know, the, the Tolays or Brugmansias, which are in the nightshades, they, again, they produce profoundly altered states, but it's not serotonin. They actually block um, acetylcholine, which is a, another neurotransmitter in the brain, and lead to some very, very odd states of consciousness. The... Um... <laughs> With all this in mind, I'm just thinking of the listener as well, right? And where would one start if they want to start looking into this? Is that, because we, we were discussing your McKenna Academy as well, which you're launching soon. Is that yeah. something what will then allow people to educate and then experience these? Yeah, uh, I mean, it's just a matter of accessing the right information. If you want to learn about this, there are books and so on that are, you know, not technical. They, I mean, there are plenty of books that are highly technical, but if you're just a, you know, a layman, whatever that means, who wants to understand neuroscience a bit, there are good references uh, out there. One of the uh, best ref online references, which you probably know about already, is uh, just specific to drugs is... Uh, uh, Arrowwood.org, you know that? I've, I've heard of it, yes. Yeah. yeah. So this is a very useful website, and it has information on every conceivable kind of psychoactive drugs that you can imagine, you know, most of which I'm not even interested in. Most people aren't interested, but the information is there. But they have very, very good information and, 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 you know, these different vaults about different psychedelics. They call them vaults. So if you go to the ayahuasca vault or the mushroom okay. vault, or lots and lots of information to quickly, um, you know, get up to speed. They include, uh, you know, links to scientific papers on how these things work, links to the chemistry of the plants, uh, and also usefully a lot of trip reports, you know, which are, which are, which are useful, especially if you're thinking about taking a, one of these things and you want to never have done it or haven't done that particular one, want to get an idea what is it like, you can go to Arrowwood very quickly, find out what other people's experiences are. So that's a very good resource. The other one that most people uh, in, in biomedicine know uh, is uh, PubMed. Uh, 
a, a lot of non-medical people um, don't know about it, but this is this is the National Library of Medicine uh, biomedical database. So, it, and it's open access; anybody in the world can access it. And uh, and anything that comes up in in biomedicine, biochemistry, anything in medicine, really. PubMed is kind of your first go-to place to see what the state of the art is. There you'll find the most recent articles, you'll find review articles and so on. For example, uh, well, there, there's just, it's a treasure trove of information. And, uh, uh, you know, for example, David Nichols, who you probably have heard of, uh, you know, he's published two or three comprehensive reviews on psychedelics because um, this has been a specialty for 50 years. So uh, he, uh, let me see, yeah, he, so, you know, you can, you can look up these references. Uh, I'll put a link to uh, PubMed here. This is, this is their main search page. Okay, beautiful. And, you know, if you, they have very sophisticated, you know, search protocols, you know, you can tailor these searches very well, um, which they have to because there are massive amounts of data. But if you just go to PubMed and plug in something like a word like psilocybin or a word like ayahuasca, then the, the sort of the current scientific picture of those things, you'll see, you'll get hundreds of references, right? And nobody can can uh, you know process all those but you can select it to say okay show me only review articles or you can link things together you know so it, it again is a, a an important educational resource for people yeah. who want to learn about these things which, which which is important right because i think um you know it's in today's day and age we're always looking for a quick fix and yeah. and if we're if we're in a situation where we're not happy or there's something been eating us away for many years and you know just jumping on a plane and 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 doing something without you know preparing yourself i think you know you could be asking for trouble yeah very much i mean these things need to be approached thoughtfully you know and you need to inform yourself as much as possible about them before you venture into it you know, and and this is just common sense. I mean, I mean, you you wouldn't go across the, you know, you wouldn't cross the ocean on a Spanish galleon to the New World. I mean, you might, but you have no idea what's going to be there. You know, and taking psychedelics is similar. You're voyaging into an unknown realm. You know, yeah. unknown for you. It helps that a lot of other people have preceded you, and so there is this body of knowledge and you can you can uh, you know you can educate yourself ahead of time as kind of what you're gonna what you can expect you know at the same time you have to remember everybody is unique so yes you know, your trip is uniquely your trip it, it will resemble other people's but it's not the same that's one of the beauties I think of psychedelics it's it's an it's a unique encounter between an individual and, and a molecule or or you know a plant yeah for what, sure and yeah. and what, what can we expect from the mckenna academy well the uh, mckenna academy is is again uh emphasizing learning you know and okay. uh, we uh i mean as the name implies we hope to have a permanent site for it right now we don't but we're doing a lot of things we're doing retreats we organize conferences uh we may be offering courses so it's a it's it's a i think of it as uh it's a mystery school in the in the spirit of elusis uh, elusis was a mystery one of the longest lived uh, longest lasting of the Mediterranean mystery schools, which use psychedelics. Psychedelics was an important part of the initiation uh, rituals that people in Greek society went 
through, if you were everybody who was anybody in Greek society between about 500 AD and maybe three or five, 500 BC to 300 AD or so, made a pilgrimage to Eleusis at some point, and they were ushered into a dark chamber, and they were given a brew, which, uh, you know, mm. probably a psychedelic of some sort, almost certainly a psychedelic, and they had an amazing experience, and they were forbidden to talk about it, right? But, of course, some did, some, le- some leaked, and <laughs> actually the, you know, the sacrament was, uh, was stolen from the Temple of Demeter, which is where it was, and, uh, and, you know, by a, a guy named Alcibiades, who was a, a heretic. He took it to his house, was basically uh, throwing acid parties with it, uh, you know. And was said, so it, the thinking is it was probably an ergot. Uh, it was made from ergot uh, infested barley. And ergot contains lysergic acid derivatives. Could have been mushrooms, could have been combinations of these things. But the idea of the Academy is that it's a 21st century elusis. It's a 20, the first 21st century psychedelic university in 1500 years. And, uh, you know, the, the uh, focus of, well, it, plant medicines, what you might, what I sometimes call plant teachers are really a big part of it, but it's not exclusively um, you know, it's not exclusively focused on that. We, we view psychedelics as learning tools. And, you know, you might say it's the first university in which uh, not all the faculty members are human, you know. <laughs> and, and uh, but they're there to facilitate learning. Well, what are we trying to learn in the academy? We're basically trying to learn about the universe, the cosmos, ourselves, our place in nature and in the cosmos. And, uh, you know, and, and so that's why I call it the McKenna Academy of Natural Philosophy. You know, natural philosophy was what science was before it became quantified and, and you know, kind of boring. Now, not that science is boring. That's a, that's a bad word. But you know, scientists preoccupied in these days with, you know, what you can measure. And there are many f- parts of phenomenon that you can't really measure, but we know they exist. Like thoughts, for example. We know what a, th- we know what a mm. thought is. We know a thought exists. Try and tell me what is a thought, you know, and how is that reflected in the brain? That's more difficult. But, But so natural philosophy is a more holistic way of trying to extend the sphere of our understanding, you know, and recognizing there are other ways of knowing things that are valid, you know, that, um, you know, uh, I mean, it does not always have to be reductionist and quantitative. That's powerful, but that's also limiting, you know, and science is, uh, you know, it's a powerful tool, but we can't assume that it has all the answers, it's, at least yeah. not in the way that it's practiced these days, you know. Reductionism is is useful, but it's, it, it necessarily requires that you narrow your focus if you're trying to, uh, you know, investigate phenomena. So, so na- the, the Academy of Natural Philosophy is to, uh, you know, teach people how to think, basically, how to use their own intuition and everything else to really push forward their understanding, you know. And Beautiful. We view psychedelics as a really important part of that, but other other things as well. So. Yeah, awesome. Well, I'll make sure I link in the show notes as well to that so people can sign up Please and start do. following it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm Dennis. I'm aware of the time, and I ask a few people uh, a few questions on the show every week to everyone, and just to just to help get a little um, to know you a little bit more. And one question I ask a lot is, um, "What's been a low point in your life, but has later turned out to be a blessing?" 
what's been a low point in my life. Yeah, but later became a blessing. Oh, well, uh, <laughs> there have been a few. <laughs> uh, I, I would say probably one of the lowest points in my life is, is when my brother got sick, you know, with terminal cancer. It completely shattered my life, you know, for years, really. Not just the period when he was sick, but then afterwards, the, the aftermath of that, trying to deal with his estate and that sort of thing. I mean, it was a very dark time for me. You know, because we were close. We were really close. We had our differences. And like being brothers, I mean, brothers fight, you know. Mm. But I loved him very much and uh, I respected him very much. I didn't always agree with him, but I did respect him. And it was really hard. And uh, But it became... I mean, I wouldn't say it's not exactly a blessing, but, you know, because I would give anything if he could still be here with us. And, you know, I often wonder what he would think of what's what's going on. But it became healing in a sense to come to terms with that, you know, and, and come to terms with that loss. And again, psychedelics were very helpful to me to, to kind of integrate that and and put yeah. that into you know into the quiver if you will and and integrate that experience so th that was one of the big ones and um you know there have been others so a lot of my you know more difficult experiences have had to do with sicknesses of loved ones you know i went through a particular similar kind of thing with my mom when she died of uh bone cancer when I was 19. Mm. So that was pretty rough, you know, uh, but a lot of, I've been lucky, you know, I, I, uh, many people have had serious, you know, misfortunes that due to not necessarily their fault, but a lot of suffering. I haven't had to suffer that much other than these types of things. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Played a lot, but haven't really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can all do that for sure. Yeah, right. Um, and, and last question is, um, if you could have dinner with anyone from any time frame, anywhere in the world, and have a conversation with them tonight, who do you think it would be and why? God, that's a tough one. Anyone at all? Well. Hmm. I have to name one person. You can name <laughs> as many as you like, I guess, and turn it into a banquet. <laughs> <laughs> well, people that would be on my uh, high on my list would be, uh, uh, you know, probably uh, I'd say C.G. Jung would be one. Maybe Stephen Hawking. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, Albert Hoffman. I actually have had wonderful conversations with him. Uh, and, uh, well, that's enough. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, fair enough. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. And, um, and to wrap it up, everything that we've covered today, is there anything you'd like to add for our listeners to ponder on? Yeah, I would just say, uh, you know, what I, I mean, I, I guess if if you want to condense things down into into a few sentences, the the the, the message I get from ayahuasca, you know, uh, over many years, and usually every time it comes up, you know, every time I take it, but the message is, you know remember how little you know, you know, and appreciate the universe for being more complex, more marvelous, more wonderful than you can possibly imagine. And don't let arrogance get in the way of trying to understand it, you know, if, if that is important to you to try to understand it. At the same time, you recognize that we know a tiny fraction of the way things really are. And 
that's okay. You're probably never going to fully understand it, but that's okay. It's not that you, the goal is not particularly to, uh, you know, exit this life with a nice tidy package of how it all is. You're not going to know how it is, even when you exit, you know, the important thing is to enjoy the process, the journey, the process of trying to understand recognizing that will it will always be imperfect you know but you can still enjoy it and have fun you know play with ideas playing with ideas is fun yeah yeah i love it you yeah. Know, you know, absolutely try not to get involved in these you know habitual ways of thinking a lot of people think that science is a you know superior thing and if it's not scientific it's not valid I, I don't go so far i think science is a beautiful thing it could also limit our understanding you know so we have to be careful these are all tools uh we have to be careful how we deploy them you know yeah yeah agreed for sure um yeah. what where, where's the best place to send everyone if they want to learn more well, they can always go to the website and uh, they can sign up for our mailing list and put their names in there. Any events that we do and, and so on will will be on that website sooner or later. I mean, we're not as good as we should be keeping everything just up to date, but we do keep it updated. And if they want to know more about the Academy, that's, you know, and then, you know, so that's one place. And then the others are, uh, you know, if, if, if you're interested in the, in the medical side of psychedelics and so on, the maps, maps, yeah. which everybody knows about Hefter, which a lot of people don't know about, but that's, that's actually Hefter is, uh, the, uh, nonprofit that, I've been involved with, I was, I'm a founder and it started in 1992 and hefter.org and is, uh, kind of leading the, uh, the research side, the clinical side for psilocybin. Got it. You know, okay. Nobody's heard of us, but we're not good publicists like maps are, but we're just as effective in doing research. And, you know, and then MAPS has kind of tied their their thing to MDMA, so they focused on that. But, you know, so those are both good sources, hefter.org, maps.org. They have lots of information, resources. Yeah, we'll link to them too. And you have a number of books as well. Would you recommend any one? Where's the best one to start with? I could always recommend my memoir, if you want a personal thing, uh, <laughs> Brotherhood of the Screaming Abyss. Uh, which is now effectively out of print. You have to, you, but you can order the ebook from uh, Amazon. Okay. And then this book, The Ethnopharmacologic Search for Psychoactive Drugs, uh, if people want to get into the uh, nuts and bolts, if they want to get into ethnopharmacology, it's published by Synergetic Press. You can order it there. And what else? And then my brother and I, we wrote books back in the day, uh, Psilocybin Magic Mushroom Grower's Guide. <laughs> we published in 1975 and his skills selling robustly. Uh, very simple methodology for growing a few mushrooms or a lot of mushrooms if you have the time and patience. But, but that's a classic. And then our other books, my brother's book, uh, True Hallucinations is uh, True Hallucinations and the Brotherhood of the Screaming Abyss really go together. People should read True Hallucinations first and then read Brotherhood of the Screaming Abyss to find out what the real story is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Dennis, thank you so much for coming on the show today, mate. I appreciate everything that you do and all the information you put out there. And uh, it was just a pleasure to have you on the show and being able to share right. it with my well, audience. Thank you. Thank you, too. It was really, it was really fun. So let me know where it's, uh, where it's posted so I can tweet it and all that. And Absolutely. It. Absolutely. So, yeah. All right, Guy. Have a wonderful day. You've got most of the day ahead of you. So I do. Good. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Bye-bye.